Yo, what's up guys? It's DJ Rick Webb and in today's video, I'm going to be showing you how to set up my favorite audio tool, the DBX Drive Rack PA2. So if you guys have been following my channel for a little while now, you guys know that I rock the DBX Drive Rack PA2 that I have right here for pretty much all of my events. I've had it now for over three years and uh, I've had it primarily in my custom built Pro X case over there so that I can control all of my audio and stuff like that. What you guys probably don't know is I actually own two of them. Uh, I have a second one that's actually down here built into this case. I have the other one out here for this demonstration. Um, but I love these things. I own two of them. We pretty much use it for every single event regardless of the size Especially on the bigger side, but we use it for all events just because it makes life really easy And I know a lot of you guys see me using it and a lot of you have purchased the thing and a lot of you have asked me How do I set it up and I made a pretty crappy video a while back that kind of walked you through it But in this video, I'm gonna walk you through a hundred percent of how you set this up I got the iPad I got all the tools that you're gonna need to set this up to use for your events for your audio system now I quickly want to preference that the Drive Rack PA2 right here, really, this is overkill. It's 100% overkill, especially for mobile DJ events. You don't need it. I am a very technical person, as most of you know. I love gear. I love tech. I, I, I geek out over tech. I know my tech. But I will 100% admit that this is complete overkill. You do not need one of these if you're a mobile DJ, unless you want all the additional features and stuff that this has, basically the bells and whistles. Similar to if you're gonna go buy a truck. You just need a truck to take you from point A to point B. You don't need a ton of bells and whistles like a leather seats and a moon roof and, oh yeah, that's, that's kinda also, S side plug, I have a truck channel where I go through my whole entire truck. Anyways, yeah, I got a truck, I Tacoma, it's, it's got all the bells and whistles. Anyway, this thing, it's all the bells and whistles for a DJ setup. You you don't need it. It it it's additional. It's not gonna make your system sound any better. It's just gonna give you more tools to manipulate your sound and make it sound the way you want to. And a lot of little tweaks that I'm gonna show you in this video. But I just want to preference that. Please do not think that you absolutely need one of these. It is complete overkill. And if you like overkill like me. Then uh, let's get on into the video. First off, I guess let me show you. Uh, this is the complete rack. I have a whole video on this. I just built it. It's super dope. It's got everything. It's got a drive rack PA2 in it. This big Yamaha 12 channel mixer board right here. Yeah, complete overkill for a mobile DJ event, but um, that's what I use. Now the other drive rack PA2 is right up here, as you guys can see. And this is what we're going to be using for this demonstration. I basically took it out of here so that way I can show you all the ports on the back because this one's built in. But anyways, this is the Drive Rack PA2, and I'm gonna start off by saying one of the coolest things about this is that you can control it with your phone. It could be either Android or Apple, or in my case, we're gonna be showing you on an iPad. I just, I like the iPad because it's bigger, it's easier to manipulate, but I definitely have been able to use it on my phone as well. So to start off, out of the box, you will not be able to connect your phone or your iPad to the Drive Rack PA2 unless you buy a router. And it doesn't need to be anything fancy. This is a pretty cheap Netgear router. I'll link this exact one in the description down below. I've been using it for three, four years now and it's I've had no trouble with it. But this is just a simple router. Like I said, it's a Netgear. You do not need internet. You just need a router that creates the network. Let me clarify that real quick because a lot of people get confused when I say you need a, you need a router with Wi-Fi. What we're doing is using this router to create a Wi-Fi network that we can communicate our device to the drive rack. We do not need internet. So this thing does not need to be hooked up to internet in any way, shape, or form. So you buy a router, you plug it in, you set it up with your 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 network name and password, or you can just use the generic one that normally is on the in the it's on the bottom of the router normally. And then you want to take an ethernet cable like this one right here and you want to plug it into the back of the dry brick right here in the ethernet port. And then you want to plug it into your router. Quickly, a common mistake is that people will plug the ethernet cord from the dry brick into the internet port on the router. 
This will not work. You need to plug it into one of the slots on the hub. So plug it into the one right next to it. This is hard to do one-handed, but plug it into one of the ports on the hub. Do not plug it into the internet. It will not work if you plug it into the internet because like I said, we're not using the internet. We're just using the network. So you want to plug it into the hub. Once you've done that, we can now move over to our device. So now moving over to our device to use the app to set up our Drive Rack PA2. First thing you want to do is download the Drive Rack PA2 app. Now, this app is available, like I said, for both Apple and Android, and I'm showing you it on my Android phone because I can't get the screen recording to work on my iPad, unfortunately. So, we're going to be doing it on the phone so that way you guys have a really clear picture to see the setup process. It's the exact same, it's the exact same app, exact same everything, so you can follow along if you have Apple or if you have Android. So, First thing to do is to download the app. I'll link down in the description down below where you can pick up the app yourself. Next thing you're gonna to wanna to do is once you have the app downloaded is connect to your router. And I will show you guys real quick that I am connected. If I go to my Wi-Fi settings, I'm connected to a DJ Rick Web network. That is this network right here. And it says connected without internet. Like I mentioned, we don't have internet in this situation. So now that we're connected to this router right here, which is connected to the drive rack, we can open up the app. Now you're gonna be greeted with this screen right here. And on the bottom left right there, there is a link to a video that DBX themselves put out on how to set up the drive rack PA2. It's a very monotoned uh, video to say the least. And it, um, it walks you through the proper way to set this up. But that's all going to change because you and I are going to set it up the exact same way so that we have the exact same settings to work with. So to do that, we're, what we're going to want to do is click on the wizard icon. Now, the Drive Rack PA2 has way more features than even what I would consider. When I said this is overkill, this really has overkill features. So on the list here, you can click run all setup wizard, which we're not going to do because Run All Setup Wizard has more features than what we could even physically use. You're, you're gonna literally get to a point where like you can't set this up because you don't have the stuff to do it. Um, so just running through, if you clicked Run All Setup Wizard, it's gonna run all three of the setup wizards below it, which are the Setup Wizard, which is the one we're gonna be doing. That's where we set up the inputs, that's where we set up the outputs, the main stuff that we're gonna be using. The next is the Auto EQ slash Level Assist. This feature is very complicated and what it does is it uses the RTA mic so the drive rack has a specialized microphone that you can buy for it and what you can do is you can put this microphone in like the middle of your room like in a front of house situation and you plug it into the front of the drive rack right here and what that microphone is going to do is it's going to listen to what it hears from the speakers themselves and then the computers inside the drive rack are going to then adjust the sound to match the EQ that you set. So if you set an EQ curve in the auto EQ, like it says, the auto EQ, what the microphone is going to do is it's going to listen to the speakers and it's going to adjust the sound so that it matches that auto EQ curve that you set. Very, very advanced feature. It sounds awesome in that, but it's it's a hassle to set up. One, you got to buy the mic and it's it's complete overkill. You can set it to your ears like I do, and you'll be perfectly fine. And then the one below that is the anti-feedback suppression wizard. Now, this is a wizard that you can use to help set up, but you can also set this up manually just in the app itself. So like I said, for this video, I'm gonna be showing you how we set it up. And what we're gonna be doing is using the wizard run setup wizard option. So we're gonna click run setup wizard, and we're gonna click run all setup. So we're gonna set up all of these things listed below our speakers, our inputs, our graphic EQ, all the goodies that we're using this for. And now the first point in this configuration is our inputs. For 90% of us, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be plugging in, there's two XLR ports on the back here, and these two are a left and right input pair, and we're gonna be getting this input pair from our device. So for 90% of us, that's going to be our controller, our mixer, our, our mixer board, so like a six channel mixer board, a 12 channel mixer board, an S9, an SZ, an SX2, a Prime 4, a Newmark controller, an SB3. Your two outputs, your left and right outputs from your device, your controller, 
are gonna plug into the drive rack PA2 as the input. Now, because we have a left and right pair, that is a stereo pair, so we're gonna click on stereo. Next, this is how we want our graphic EQ to be set up. I always select stereo linked. Now we get to the speaker setup. So if you follow the drive rack or the DBX's video guide on how to set this up, they're gonna show you the proper way. From the factory, it's set up to be very simple with a high, a mid, and a low output. So if you're running powered speakers and you have two speakers and two subs, you would set it up to run the high output as your two tops and the low output as your two lows. What I have done though is discovered a hack to be able to now use this instead of being high, mid, and low. You will now have three full range outputs that you can use for whatever you would like. So say you have your main setup with two subs and two speakers. So I wanna run my, my high output as my two main speakers and I wanna run my low output as my two subs and then I wanna use this mid output as my two backfill speakers. So that way I can set up the, the mid output to be a, a full range output, the high output will just be the highs and then the lows will just be the subs. Or say even, even in a weirder situation, I want to run the high output to my subs and I want to run the low output to my tops. The way I'm going to show you to set this up, you can do that because we're going to have three full range outputs, full range that we can use for whatever we want. And the way we do that is by clicking not listed for all of the speaker options. I'm going to click not listed. I'm going to click two way so that way I get the mid output of two way. Are we using subs? Yes, because we want that third output. Again, we're going to select not listed for our subs. Now it's going to ask you how you want your subs configured. And this is a good thing to consider. So if your setup consists of one sub, so say you have a dual 18 subwoofer or one single 18 inch subwoofer in front of your setup all the time, click mono. That way all you have to do is run one XLR cable from the drive rack to that one sub and you're good to go. Or even in a case like the school dances I do where we run two, four, or eight subs, I will still set it up at mono so that way I'm only running one XLR cable from here to that first sub and I just link to the other subs. Good to go. But if you're running pair subs, so a sub on the left side of your setup, one on the right side of your setup, what you're gonna do is set it up as a stereo output. Now you can also run a stereo output for that one sub in front. You're just gonna have to run two XLR cables from the drive rack to the sub. So that's why you use mono, so you only have to use one XLR cable. Mono is left and right together in one cable versus separated. Continuing with the theme of this video though, I wanna show you guys three full range outputs so that we can use the lows for highs if we want to. If we wanted to do three sets of speakers, like three different top speakers, EQs and everything, three full range outputs, we would click stereo. So we're gonna click stereo, continuing with the theme of this video. Next, we're gonna wanna select our amplifiers and continuing with the theme, we're gonna click not listed. Again, this is not really the most proper way to set this up, but it is the hack. So mid amps not listed, low amps not listed. Do I want to apply the current changes? Yes. So now it will go through and it will apply those changes that we just made to our setup. And uh, you just saw on the screen right there, it said setup complete. So we are all done and ready to go for the most part. So we're gonna click home. Now, on the home screen, this kind of lays out the map, basically, of how the audio travels through the drive rack and out the drive rack. So, going from left to right, I'll dive into each one of these features here in a second, but I want to show you guys how we set this up properly first before we dive into the additional bells and whistles that you got. But starting on the left side here, we have our input, our left and right input that comes from our device. The first thing it's gonna hit is our graphic EQ. This is where we can set our EQ to make it sound the way we want it to sound. The next thing it's gonna hit is that auto EQ. Again, if you're using the RTA mic, you can use the auto EQ to make your sound be a little bit better, etc. Um, but for 90% of us, we're not doing that. So we don't use the auto EQ. Next is anti-feedback suppression. This is something that if you're using microphones, you're gonna love and we'll dive into that in a second. Next thing is subharmonic synthesis. And uh, this is basically a tool to manipulate your subs to make them sound better. I don't typically use it. It's just an additional feature. It's, it's really just one of those overkill features. Again, um, you don't necessarily need to do it. Next is the compressor and the best way I can describe the compressor is 
it protects your speakers against from idiots that like the red line the mixer. Next thing is input delay, and input delay is something that we're typically never gonna mess with. It's similar to the auto EQ and the sub harmonic synthesis. It's an additional bells and whistles thing that you will not need to use. So after the input travels through all of those little features, it gets to the crossover. This is the important part. This is where those full range outputs come into play. So let's click on the crossover real quick. Now, as you can see here, we have a green, a yellow, and a red, and they're labeled high, mid, and lows. These are our three full range outputs. And the graph on the screen here is our frequency range and our dB amount. So on the left hand side, we have the dB scale all the way from negative 60 dB all the way up to plus 20 dB with zero being the big white line down the center. And from left and right, we have our frequency response. So it looks like uh, 10 hertz all the way on the left, all the way up to 20K hertz on the right. So now we're going to modify these so that they are full range outputs. And what we're going to do is we're going to unlock the crossover and it's going to say warning adjusting the crossover could cause potential damage to your speakers and they're, they're kind of right. If you are using passive speakers you definitely need to know what you are doing before you start messing with the crossover. If you're using powered speakers, powered speakers already have built-in crossovers for the most part inside of them so that they will not be able to use frequencies that they just can't use. So they have it built into most of the speakers. So there's a, a lot more forgiveness with powered speakers. So keep that in mind. If you're using passive speakers, you definitely need to know what you're doing. Power speakers, you can get away with tweaking it, but I'm gonna be showing you guys the proper way to do that regardless. So let's get into it. We're gonna click OK. Now for this crossover setup, our high, mid, and lows, or our outputs, one, two, and three, here's what I'm gonna be doing. Our high output is gonna be going to our top speakers. In this setup that I'm gonna be configuring on the crossover is going to consist of two top speakers with a center sub. For this crossover setup that I'm gonna be showing you guys, the speaker configuration that we're gonna be basically going for is that we have two top speakers and we have two subs and then we have two full range tops that are gonna be back fills, side fills, or in some other area where they need to be full range because they're not close enough to the subs. So this is the setup that I'm going through. I'm basically gonna show you how to set up subs, how I would set them up on the crossover, how I would set up tops that are paired with subs, and then how I would set up tops that are out by themselves doing their own thing. All right, one more thing before I start messing with the high and the mid and the low to modify it to the way I want. I want to kind of show you guys or basically clarify on this graph what frequencies are low frequencies, what frequencies are mid frequencies, and what frequencies are high frequencies. So you can kind of understand when we're setting up these speakers what we're looking to do. And on the screen right now, it's pretty much set up that way. So if you look here, anything basically above 3 kilohertz, so 3000 hertz right here on the right hand side on the in the green section that is considered your highs now in the mids mids is a, a very large range because you have mid bass true mids and mid high so mids cover basically everything from 100 hertz all the way up to 5 kilohertz it covers a very wide range typically your main mids are found around 500 to 2 kilohertz. Those are like the main true mids. Uh, 100 hertz to 500 hertz is normally like your mid bass. Typically, don't take my word for this. I know audio techs are going to get me in the comments below, but this is the general conception. And then your lows in red here, all of your lows typically are normally around 120 hertz and under. Um, or 100 hertz and under, that's what's considered low bass. That's your, that's your that's where all the, the FUD FUD bass comes in. So this was just to give you guys an understanding of on this graph where we're gonna be looking for different frequency ranges. So back to my example, we're gonna now set up our high output. The high output or output number one is gonna be those top speakers that are above our subs. 
And for that, I want to consider what is going to be my crossover point. So my crossover point is where do I want my subs to stop producing sound and where do I want my tops to continue producing sound so that they're not producing the same sound. I want my subs to take care of all my lows and then I want my top speakers to take care of all my mids and highs so that they're not overworking trying to produce the lows that my subs are already producing. And for me personally, my favorite crossover point is 100 hertz. So that is where we're gonna be setting up our tops. So I'm gonna drag this high pass over to right around 100 hertz. Now on my low pass, I'm gonna leave it all the way out because I want it to produce all of our highs, all the mids, all the highs, all the way out to the right side of the graph. The third toggle below the high pass and the low pass is the gain. And this is something that you're gonna play around with when you're setting up your speakers. And the gain is what it is. It's, it's literally how loud the signal is. You never wanna go above zero on the gain um, and basically the gain is something that is speaker dependent. So that's something that I'll explain how you set up for all of them here towards the end. But below the gain, we do want to talk about the polarity and the type. Polarity, you, you basically never want to mess with this. This is always set to normal. Now on the type, this is adjusting those slopes. So the slope you see on the left there, we can adjust by selecting different amounts. Me personally, I like to use the Butterworth style, not the... Linkwitz, uh, Linkwitz Riley. It's just, it's, it's a different type. Um, each person has their preference. I like Butterworth. That's what I'm going to be talking about. And for my highs, I typically like to go with like a 24 dB octave. So I want a 24 dB drop off. Um, so I kind of want like a mid to sharp curve coming down. That's typically what I go for with my highs. Now I'm going to go to my mid real quick and I'm going to, uh, bring the gain down to zero so that way you guys can see the overlap that I'm going to be doing with the lows. So with the lows, this is our third output. This is what's going to be going to the subs that are underneath of the top. So again, we want our crossover point to be at 100 hertz, which it already is set. That's our low pass. And then for our high pass, I typically go with about 30 hertz. That's what I'm typically using. Now on the types here. Um, you want to have a semi-gradual taper on the right side. I like to go with a Butterworth 12 on the right-hand side of my low cutoff. And then on the left-hand side, I like to make this very sharp. So I'm going to go with a Butterworth 48 octave. So as you guys can see on the screen right here, this is the setup for the main speakers that we're using. So the tops and the subs. The subs are handling all the frequency ranges in red. So you can kind of see the amount that they're doing and then they cross over at 100 hertz. So everything in green then is where our top speakers take over. And this is how a crossover works. And this right here, like I've been mentioning, is a 100 hertz crossover setup or just a crossover setup in general. In this case, we're at 100 hertz. This is the same thing as if you ran your audio into your sub first and then you selected high pass out, that right there is a crossover as well. It does the exact same thing. This right here is just showing you what it does, what it does virtually, and this is how we set it up inside the drive rack. It's the proper way to do it. So this right here is how I would set up my tops with my subs for my setup inside of our crossover. Now I did mention we want to set up that second output, the mid here, the second one, as a full range output. So this is similar to if you're just running two tops. Um, these could be your two main tops, these could be two back tops. This is how I would set up the crossover for those tops. So let me up the gain real quick so that way you can see what we're dealing with. Now on the low pass side, we're gonna run and run it out because we want all the highs all the way out. Now on the low hand side, we don't want to go all the way out because top speakers cannot produce low frequencies, like low, low frequencies. If you look up the specs on your speakers, they will tell you what their frequency range is, and then you can set up your speakers accordingly to that. But in most case scenarios, most top speakers cannot produce frequency notes under 40 hertz. So for that purpose, I'm going to set my low roll off at 40 hertz on the mid setup for this mid speaker. So I'm gonna bring down my high pass here to 
40, 40 hertz. 39, good enough. And then on my roll off type, I'm going to click on the type real quick and I'm going to select a semi mid to shallow. I'm going to go with an 18 dB octave Butterworth. That's typically what I use. And that would be my full range output. So if I take the gain down on my highs and lows real quick. Right there would be my full range setup for just running two speakers. And again, we're using the second output for this. And then our highs right here, these would be for two speakers on a 100 hertz crossover between the highs and the lows. So that right there kind of shows you how I set up my speakers inside of the crossover for running a speaker and a sub configuration and just a speaker in general. But like I've been mentioning, we have three separate outputs. So in this case scenario right here, I have this set up so that I can run my two top speakers, my two subs, and then I have a second full range output that I can send to two rear fill speakers that are running full range. And you can move those around too, like I mentioned. You can run the, the setup I had for the lows, how I configured the lows right here, you can set that for the high output. So it could be output number one, could be going to your subs. And then output number two could be going to your top. So you would set it up like the high. I hope that makes sense. You basically have three full range outputs that you can set and configure however the heck you want. Now, like I mentioned, I did skip completely over the gain to talk about the gain and how you set it up. I will talk about that here at the end of the video when we actually hook up the audio and I'll show you how you configure it. Uh, with speakers. So let's go back to home now that our crossovers are set up properly. So obviously on the right hand side there we see our three separate left and right outputs. Those highs, mids, and lows or in our case one, two, and three. Our top is the high or what we're going to be sending to our tops. The middle one is the mid or what we're going to be sending to those rear fill speakers. And then the third is our subs. Now one thing I set up on all three of these outputs is the limiter. So I'm going to click on the limiter real quick and I kind of have a general setup that I put on all of them. And what the limiter does is what, what it sounds like. It limits the sound and basically protects your speakers in a way. It's like the, the last bit of defense to just kind of keep it uh, tame, keep the sound tame so that it doesn't overpower the speaker. Now the compressor is the first line of defense. That's the first line of defense to protect against people that are redlining the mixer. The limiter is kind of like that last little bit of defense to protect against where a song has like a, a really loud crescendo or a really loud uh, peak in it and it kind of tapers down to the normal level. That's kind of what the limiter is there to protect against. So I have a typical setup that I do and that setup that I apply to all of my outputs is the threshold I put at negative five to negative six dB. I want like a five dB threshold and then I set an over easy to six. So that's, that's typically uh, right around there is about the setup that I do. So basically if you kind of want to reference it, um, when I pull this back and kind of see where there's the red and there's the yellow, I basically set it at an over easy of six and then I bring it up to the point where there is no more red showing, just yellow. That right there is typically what I'm doing for my limiters. Um, please feel free to leave in the comment section down below if you have a different setup. Um, this is just the one that I found works best for me over the last uh, four years of using the dry rack, um, I find that it's it's not too overpowering of a limiter and it's just enough to do a little bit of protection and just kind of tame the sound a little bit, tame those high bits of the sound to basically keep the, the sound consistent throughout the setup. So that's the limiter setup that I use and I'm going to quickly apply that to all of my outputs. And there we go. I have my limiters set up on all of my outputs so they're ready to go. They're highlighted. That's one thing to point out when a little segment over here is ever in white. It basically means that it is active and it's actively doing what it's supposed to do. If it's in gray, it is not active and it's not working. All right, so with our limiters in place and our crossover set, we're pretty much ready to go with our speakers. Now, like I said, there's a lot of other features in here like the graphic EQ, the anti-feedback suppression, the parametric EQ, alignment delay, and this video has got very long um, just talking about setup. And we pretty much have covered all the main aspects of setup other than um, setting our gains. So I'm going to end this video by talking about gains and inputs. And that's pretty much all that we're going to be talking about on this video. 
I will make a separate video diving into all the little itty bitty features, diving into alignment delay, diving into parametric EQs, and basically talking about all the other features of this anti-feedback suppression. I'll make individual videos for those specific topics that way that this doesn't get too lengthy in this video i just really wanted to cover how you set up the drive rack so that you have three separate full range outputs and to start off with our gain structure the first thing we need to do is get our input gain set up correctly and to do that we need to start with our source our mixer so what i'm going to do here with my pioneer ddj s9 uh, same thing for an SZ, same thing for any speaker, is I'm going to make sure that I am set up to produce a 0 dB signal. So it's nice and helpful on the S9 and the SX2 and the 1000 and the SZ that they have a basically a little color readout. So what we're going to want to do is basically bring this up so that we are producing a 0 dB signal. And that is indicated by the first level of yellow on the S9 mixer. So right now we're producing up to a 0 dB max signal. So we are good to go here. We will now go to our drive rack to make sure we're configured properly for the 0 dB input. So if we check our drive rack real quick, you can see that it's only hitting about 10 dB. So if we check the input level on our drive rack PA2 here, it's showing that we're hitting about 10 dB of input level, negative 10 dB. Zero up here is 0 dB. This is negative 3, negative 10, negative 15, negative 20, etc. So we're hitting really low because we're producing 0 dB over there, but we're only getting about 10, negative 10 dB over here. Now don't fret, there's actually a switch on the back of the drive rack PA2. Now in the audio industry, there's two forms or two typical levels of input. There is plus 4 dBU and negative 10 dBV. Now I'm not going to go into all the technical details because honestly I don't really know much about them. I've watched videos on them and it gets really complicated. I kind of understand it but I don't. Basically what you need to know is there's two different level inputs with audio. The most common form for us DJs and this goes pretty much across the board is negative 10 dBV. Plus 4 dBU is, it's, it's rare in our industry. So as you saw on the front, I'm hitting about negative 10 dB. So I'm not hitting the exact same. So that means I'm running the wrong input level. And if we look right here on the back of the drive rack PA2, we will see a little button switch here that indicates either a plus 4 dBU input or a negative 10 dBV input. Right now the button is out indicating a plus 4 dBU input which is why we are not hitting 0 dB on the drive rack like we are on our mixer. So I'm going to push this button in real quick and we'll be able to go around to the front of the drive rack now. We can now see that we are ticking up into the negative 3 almost to 0 dB, very similar to what we are running on the S9 mixer back behind me. So our input's good now. Now let's talk about those outputs in the crossover. So now to configure the gain level output for our speakers, what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to also set up our high mids and lows right around 0 dB. So now on the gain level for our crossover, what we're going to want to do is set them up also at 0 dB output. Now for me personally, I like to leave myself a little bit of a buffer room. So typically I set them up at right around negative three to negative five. I just, I, I don't like running zero dB all the way out to the speakers. I like to have a little bit of a cushion room. So I'm gonna go in now and I'm gonna set up my highs at right around negative three. I'm gonna set my mids right around negative three. And then my lows, this is typically where I go about negative five. I like to have a little more cushion on my lows. And now that's where you set the gain levels initially on the drive rack. The next thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go to your speakers. So you're going to want to set up your speakers and then you're going to want to turn the gain knob if you have knob. So that is where we set the gains at initially. Next, you're going to want to set up your speakers, right? So set up your speakers. And now if you have speakers that have digital readouts, like the SRX series speakers or like the EKXs, I know a lot of the EV stuff has it now where you can set the input dB level. You're going to want to set the input dB level at 0 dB. Don't touch it. 0 dB, that's what I set my SRXs at. 
set it at zero dB or if you have speakers with the little gain knob then with the speaker set at zero dB you're gonna want to basically turn on your audio turn it all the way up to zero dB and make sure that your speaker is not clipping if your speaker is clipping what you're gonna want to do is go into your crossover and reduce the gain so let me just repeat that one more time with something like my SRX series speakers where they have a DB reading on the back where it says what is your input level I want to set it up at 0 dB so then I play music I play sound at 0 dB on my S9 mixer on my SE I put 0 dB there I then have my gain output on my dry rack set to like negative 3 dB and then I want to check my speaker and make sure it is not clipping so if it is hitting limit, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into my high gain here and I'm going to lower it down until I am not clipping, I am not limiting. And then that is where I leave my speaker again initially. Now, if your speaker has a gain knob where you kind of just turn it to basically turn the speaker up, the gain knob, you guys know it's found on the PRX series speakers and stuff. What you're gonna wanna do is put zero dB output on your mixer back there, negative three-ish, negative three to negative five-ish output on your dry rack PA2. And then you're gonna to to turn that gain knob up until you hit limit, until you hit peak, and then you're gonna to wanna to dial it back a little bit. And then you're set and ready to go. Now, what, now that process right there is setting our maximum levels. Those are our maximum levels. So that is something you kinda of just wanna keep in mind, keep thinking about in your head. I know with my certain types of speakers, I know where my gain knob needs to be turned to to be zero dB. I know with my SRX series speakers, I know I have to have my high output about negative one to negative three dB to not be clipping. It's just stuff that you learn over time, um, but it's stuff that you can adjust on the fly as well. Now, I will tell you right now, I said that is our max levels, and I said that for a reason. A lot of times with our speakers, we get into rooms where we do not need to use all the power of our speakers. I know a lot of us like to blare our speakers, but trust me, with my SRXs, with my VRXs, a lot of times I do not need to play them at balls to the wall maximum level. So what I do is I set them up to their max levels, right? And then instead of adjusting the volume levels on the back of the speakers, I know they're set to their maximum levels. I will adjust the gains from the drive rack because I can do it live from my iPad, from my device in front of the setup. So I can basically listen to the setup in the room and then I can adjust my gain appropriately for the room. A lot of you guys have seen me at school dances where I basically go out in front of the setup and I'll basically be like, well, I set the tops at negative 10 dB for this room, and I set the subs at like uh, negative 20 dB. That's because I didn't need to use the maximum power. The maximum power of those speakers was too freaking loud. So I dialed them back to the appropriate levels, but I used the gain feature inside of the dry rack PA2, because like I said, it's very handy. So Again, what I talked about there was how we set the maximum levels, and that's something you kind of just know and you learn over time based on the speakers that you have. And then at events, basically, you can adjust the gain level for that output, all three of those outputs, you can adjust the gain level to the appropriate level for that room, keeping in mind the maximum level, which typically is going to be around that negative three to negative five, or you could set it up at zero dB so that way you know, hey, my speakers start clipping when I hit zero dB on the gain meter right here. So I know if I go above zero dB, I am definitely in the red and I'm clipping the speaker and damaging it. I know if I'm below zero dB, I'm perfectly fine. And that's about where I set them. That right there, guys, is how you set up your speakers inside of the drive rack PA2 to be three full range outputs. Now, one additional thing before I go off the screen and I finish up this video real quick, above the low, mid, and high, there are these little green boxes right here and they're emulated here on the drive rack above them. They're also green. You may and you probably will see those turn yellow at some point during your events, even during sound check, you'll see them start to turn yellow. Do not worry, this is normal. So 
It is a green, yellow, red system on the drive rack. Those limiters are there to protect our speakers. They're, they're there to kind of just monitor the audio, any little peaks, they kind of just suppress it down and keep it all good to go. If those green lights turn to yellow or they start to kind of flicker to yellow, that means that the limiter is doing its job. The limiter is active and it's doing its job and you're all good to go. Your limiter is there, it's doing its job, and you're perfectly fine, nothing to worry about. What you don't want though is that limiter to turn from yellow to red. When it turns to red, that means that your audio is surpassing what the limiter can possibly do. This is a very bad situation. Um, I've never ran into it, but it's something you need to monitor or just watch out for when you're initially starting to learn this stuff. It's not something that you will probably run into, just something to keep your eyes out for because I know, um, at least in my videos early on, a lot of people were pointing out that they were turning yellow and that's bad, that's bad. If they turn yellow, that means they're doing their job, they're doing what they're there for. That It's just indicating to you that the processor is doing what it's designed to do, the limiters are doing what they're designed to do. If they turn to red, like I said, that's bad. All right guys, that right there kind of wraps up the whole entire setup of how you set up and configure your speakers inside of the Drive Rack PA2. I am sorry this video is probably extremely lengthy, uh, but that's what you have to do to go into detail on the Drive Rack PA2. And we didn't even cover everything in the Drive Rack PA2 because like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, this is overkill for mobile DJs. You don't necessarily need this, but if you want it, you can get it. I will go through all the additional stuff such as anti-feedback suppression, alignment delay, compressors, graphic EQs, parametric EQs in separate videos coming up so that way I can dive into those a little bit more detail. But this right here was kind of a very lengthy overview of the bulk portion of why I use the Drive Rack PA2. Two last little points that I want to kind of harp on with audio and I've, and I've made multiple videos on this. First rule is you never want to produce audio above zero dB. There's a reason why on your mixer board, if you have a color readout, anything above zero dB turns to orange and then turns to red. You're getting into the bad area of audio. That's when you start to distort audio. Audio is designed to be played at zero dB. That's when you are not adding anything to it. That's when you're not subtracting anything. Audio systems are designed to play back at zero dB because at zero dB you are not adding anything to it which causes distortion. The second thing is along the lines of zero dB you do not want to be limiting or peaking your speakers. That little light that pops up, you don't want that to be on. That light should not be on solid. It's okay if it kind of flickers now and then, but if that light is on solid, like your peak light, your red light, or your yellow light on your speaker is just sitting there on, that is bad. I hope this video was helpful to some degree. Again, it got really lengthy and I got into a lot of detail, but if this video was helpful, please slap a big like on this video. It helps a lot, especially with the whole YouTube algorithms and shit that are going on now. Hit the like button, it helps a lot. Leave a comment down below, that also helps a lot. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you can see all the awesome videos that I'm gonna be making on the Driver PA2, audio in general, lighting, gig logs, all that fun stuff. I hope you guys enjoy it. As always, my name is DJ Rick Webb. Keep the record spinning, and I will see you guys next time.